Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Leif Alshawaf. She is Assistant Professor of Psychology at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Before, he was an assistant professor at Bilkent University in Turkey and visiting fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin, Germany. He has taught and conducted research in several different countries and is a member of the Arab-German Young Academy as well as an academic advisor at Ideas Beyond Borders. So Leif, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. It's my pleasure. Okay, great. So, I mean, today uh, we're going to focus on some of your articles. We're going to start with one where you tackle some common misconceptions about uh, natural selection, and then we're going to go through another one uh, that is titled Evolutionary Psychology, uh, How to Guide, and then uh, another one about um, learning context and uh, environment in evolutionary psychology, and then another one that uh, is on that was published on Air Aereo magazine about mis general misunderstandings about the discipline of evolutionary psychology. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> let's start with a very common criticism that people put forth against. Um, hypotheses based on natural selection, particularly when they are applied to uh, human psychology, that is, when they are applied to evolutionary psychology, that is the one about just so stories. So, I mean, I, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I have this idea that uh, possibly one of the reasons why people think that evolutionary psychology just brings about these just so stories and it's nothing uh, nothing beyond that is the fact that I, I mean sometimes when when in evolutionary psychology people say that um, if in during our evolutionary history we perform the particular kind of behavior then that increased our fitness in the context where we evolved then because of our folk psychological intuitions people immediately think that we are talking about something that people decided at the conscious level, let's say they really thought, oh, okay, so I'm going to do this because this will bring this result in terms of increasing my fitness or something like that. Uh, and then also because since we are talking about things that happened uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, sometimes when it comes to certain adaptations, probably millions of years ago, then people probably also think that we aren't really able to directly uh, test or falsify the hypothesis put forth. So, the, I mean, do you think this, this has been a very long introduction to the question, but do you think the, uh, that that makes sense in any way? I do think that makes sense. I think you put your finger on two different issues. The first one is the idea that if you're engaging in behaviors that contribute to fitness and if we're claiming that you have evolved psychological mechanisms that contribute to fitness then that implies that you're either consciously making decisions about this is what I would like to do in order to be more likely to survive or more likely to reproduce um, and you know or even if it's not conscious, the idea is that the organism is actually computing or calculating the likelihood of this event affecting fitness. So for example, if, if I say that you are more likely to help your full siblings than your half siblings, that doesn't imply that you're actually calculating, hmm, full siblings share 50% of their genes with me, half siblings only share 25% of their genes with me, therefore if I help the full sibling that's going to give me a greater return on investment when it comes to survival and reproduction. Instead, all you really need is um, a greater feeling of emotional closeness with the full sibling compared to the half sibling or a greater feeling of affection to the full sibling than the half sibling 
or um, a greater willingness to sacrifice your own well-being for a full sibling compared to a half sibling. You don't actually need to be engaging in those computations, whether consciously or not. And we don't seem to think that about other species. When some, for example, plants, even plants will, if they're surrounded by kin, they'll reduce their competition with their neighbors who are kin. And if they're surrounded by non-kin, they'll increase their competition. So, for example, when they're surrounded by non-kin, they'll increase their um, allocation of resources to their leaves so that they can, quote, steal resources and sunlight from their neighbors. Whereas if they're surrounded by kin, they'll invest more resources in their branches and their roots so that they grow higher, but they're not crowding out as much their neighbors. But nobody would think that that implies that we're saying that plants are engaging in conscious computations about what to do when they're surrounded by kin versus non-kin. So I think you're right that people think that when we make these statements about humans, we are somehow implying that humans are engaging in these conscious calculations and computations. But, but that's not the implication of these statements, and we don't seem to think that for ants or plants or any other species. So it's, it's unfortunate that people think that when it comes to humans. So I think you're right in pointing that out. And then the second thing you point out is the idea that we're not able to test these hypotheses because they have a historical element and um, we can't travel back into the past and therefore we're basically engaging in just so storytelling. And I don't know for sure why people think this, but I have an idea. And the idea is that because evolutionary psychological hypotheses all implicitly contain a historical element, and because we can't travel into the past, nor do we have perfect and complete knowledge of the past, people put those two things together. Evolutionary psychological hypotheses have an implicit historical element. We can't travel into the past, and we don't have perfect and complete knowledge of the past. Therefore, it's impossible to test evolutionary psychological hypotheses. The reason I think that's wrong is because you don't need to travel into the past to test evolutionary psychological hypotheses, nor do you need to have complete and perfect knowledge of the past. Instead, um, an ev a hypothesis about our evolved psychology yields predictions in the modern day about how modern humans will behave in the modern day. So, for example, if you think, if you claim that disgust evolved to protect us from disease or to reduce the likelihood of infection, you don't need to travel into the past to test it. What you need to do is figure out what predictions that yields in the modern day. For example, maybe you might predict that we'll be more disgusted by more pathogenic items than we would be by less pathogenic items. You might predict that when we are immunosuppressed, we'll experience an increase in disgust to compensate for our suppressed immune system. You might predict that those with higher levels of disgust are less likely to get sick or get sick less often. But all of those predictions are predictions that you can test on modern humans in the modern world using the normal experimental method or questionnaire methods or the normal methods that psychologists always use. So I think you're right that people have a perception that it is impossible to test these evolutionary hypotheses. And if you ask me, part of the reason why there's this misperception is the mistaken notion that in order to test them, you would need either you would need behavior to fossilize or you'd need to be able to travel into the past or something like that. But once you realize that um, there is a historical element in generating the hypothesis, but there's no historical element in testing the hypothesis. Testing the hypothesis merely involves um, figuring out what predictions it yields in the modern day and then going out and testing modern humans, then the problem disappears. Mm -hmm. Right. And now let us talk about another misunderstanding, another common one, that is that natural selection builds perfectly designed biological mechanisms. And applying these again to psychology, to evolutionary psychology in this case, uh, I mean, I guess that the problem here is that many times people, when they find, for example, that the same underlying psychological mechanism might produce uh, different results in different people or different results in different contexts, different uh, ecological conditions, for example, or even 
um, that it's not always the case that in the same person the, we, we get the same result all the time. I mean, and sometimes also the psychological mechanism hasn't evolved to produce what is exactly the kind of behavior that would increase uh, fitness in the best way possible, let's say it's a little bit imperfect, um, then people te tend to dismiss the fact that, uh, I mean, that, that is, it, is, it really has a, an evolutionary slash biological basis. I mean, is this what this uh, misunderstanding is about? Yeah, well, I think I think you named uh, a couple of different important things there. The most basic one is probably the idea that if it doesn't work perfectly, if it occasionally makes mistakes or if it doesn't seem optimal, then it's not evolved. That's a misperception that people have. And um, that's an odd one because natural selection is not supposed to or expected to build perfectly designed mechanisms. Instead, there's lots of constraints or limits on the power of natural selection. Um, for example, there's uh, the constraint of available genetic material. Natural selection is only able to work on whatever available genetic variation there is in the population. So if there simply is not genetic variation for a particular trait, well then that trait is never going to evolve even if there's a strong selection pressure for it because um, selection can't craft an adaptation if there's no raw materials with which to work. The same way an engineer wouldn't be able to build something if he or she didn't have the raw materials that, that they needed. And then, of course, there's plenty of other uh, constraints on natural selection. For example, there's time lags. There's the fact that it takes a long time for selection to craft um, adaptations. And so sometimes you find yourself in an environment where your brain and your body have evolved for a past environment, but you're now currently in a new one. Us, for example, we evolved in a very different environment than we live in today, and so we now are... Um, sometimes we experience an evolutionary mismatch between the environment that we evolved in and the environment that we have it today, inhabit today, and so that leads to some maladaptive outcomes. Um, and then there's several other constraints on natural selection, but there's actually even more interesting things to be said here. I think one of them is that sometimes mechanisms evolve and they produce errors as part of their design. And a good way of thinking about this is under the rubric of error management theory. And error management theory is based on signal detection theory, and the basic idea is that sometimes a species will face a decision-making problem, and in any decision-making problem, there's two kinds of errors you can make, a type one error or a false positive, or a type two error or false negative. And if it's the case that there's an asymmetry in the cost of these two types of errors, such that one of them is recurrently more costly than the other, then the species will evolve decision-making mechanisms that are adaptively biased toward the less costly error. And so, uh, for example, Randy Nessie, the evolutionary psychiatrist, has uh, suggested that this basic kind of uh, analysis is why our anxiety systems are overreactive because our anxiety systems can either react to a non-threat that's one kind of mistake that they can make or they can fail to react to a real threat and one of these is more costly than the other failing to react to a real threat is more costly than the other and so we evolve an anxiety mechanism that is adaptively biased toward the less costly error, which means it ends up being hyper-reactive or over-reactive. Now, the interesting thing about that is that by design, this mechanism is going to make mistakes because the uh, being biased toward the less costly error entails making mistakes in the less costly direction. It's just that overall, that is less costly than a mechanism that would have made perhaps an equal number of mistakes in both directions but more of those mistakes would have ended up being um, in the dangerous direction. So essentially, this idea is that some mechanisms evolve to be biased in the direction of less, the less costly error, which means that uh, they will make errors as part of their design. Uh, other, other people have argued that the same thing is true of disgust, 
that the discussed system can either fail to detect a real pathogenic threat or it can detect a, detect a threat that isn't a real threat and that the more dangerous thing is failing to detect a real pathogenic threat and as a result our discussed system has evolved to be adaptively biased toward the less costly error and it's over responsive and some researchers have argued this is why we sometimes get disgusted by non-contagious non-infectious things like burn wounds or obesity or other kinds of um, malformations in the body and face that aren't infectious but the reason that our disgust system is activated by them is that our disgust system is over responsive but it's not a random kind of mistake or an arbitrary kind of mistake it's a systematic bias in the direction of the less costly error so that's another way that you can get mechanisms that are that appear imperfectly designed because they're making mistakes but the uh, making of those mistakes is actually part of their design and exists for a good reason so i think uh, that answers only part of your question because in the beginning you were talking about uh, remind me you were saying that sometimes these mechanisms produce different results in different contexts or in different individuals mm -hmm. yes I also refer to that yeah yeah so um, I don't think there's any reason to expect uh, an evolved mechanism to produce the same results in different contexts or to produce the same results in different people as as I'm sure we'll talk about later evolved mechanisms are context sensitive and so you would expect them to produce different outputs in different contexts you would also expect them to produce different outputs in different individuals because different individuals come with different for example immune systems and mate values and strengths and intelligence and so on um, I'm guessing we'll, we'll get to that later but I guess a, a brief way of putting it is that there's no reason to expect an evolved psychological mechanism to produce the same output, um, regardless of context or, or individual differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will leave the rest of that to later on in the interview, because I have a, a specific question about that when okay. we get into the article, the paper about uh, learning context and environment in evolutionary psychology. So now talking about another misunderstanding, and this is also very, very common, I mean, uh, when people, sometimes people say that if you say that a particular psychological mechanism is the result of evolution or has some evolutionary basis to it, then because natural selection, the material that it, wor that it works with is the genetic material, then it is based on genes, on genetics, and thus it is genetically determined so could you explain what's wrong with this claim sure yeah um, I think it's it's a non sequitur the idea that something is evolved doesn't imply or lead to the conclusion that it is genetically determined and I think there's a couple of different ways of seeing that one way of seeing that is that an evolutionary perspective highlights the importance of the environment first of all it's the environment that sets up the selection pressures that drive the evolution of adaptations in the first place and second of all the environment is necessary to um, help the mechanism or adaptation develop across the organism's lifespan during ontogeny and then third of all the environment is relevant in activating or triggering the adaptation in the present moment as well and so far from being genetically determined the environment is relevant and important at every time scale that uh, that matters it drives the evolution of adaptations in the first place it's relevant to the development of the mechanism across ontogeny and it's relevant to the activation or triggering of the mechanism in the immediate now in the present moment that's one way i think of seeing why an evolutionary perspective uh, does not lead to genetic determinism and highlights the importance of the environment but the other thing is that really all life scientists including all evolutionary psychologists are aware that every aspect of our bodies and minds and our behavior are jointly co-determined by genes and environment working together and so our noses our religious beliefs our ears our intelligence our height our disgust systems all of that without exception is jointly built by genes and environment working together 
So it is a common misconception that the products of evolution are genetically determined, but there's simply no there's no reason to think that, and it's a non sequitur to think that the statement X is evolved implies X is genetically determined. Mm -hmm. But even if there's no uh, genetic determinism in evolution or uh, applying it specifically to psychological mechanisms, it's still important for us to understand um, the kinds of brains that the genes that we have give rise to, even though, I mean, this is not genetically determined, there's stochastic events during uh, brain development and also uh, the kinds of information we are exposed to, the kinds of inputs that our brains get also influence that development. But I mean, it's still important for us to understand what are the evolutionary or biological basis that give that gave rise to our brains because also the ways that our brains process information from the environment is at least uh, to to some extent uh, explained by the way they are organized right yeah yeah, I mean, w when I say that evolution does not imply genetic determinism, I don't mean to say that the genes don't matter or that they're irrelevant. Uh, certainly, they are important and they are necessary in a full understanding of any given phenomenon. And if we want to understand how the brain processes information, we're going to need to understand how genes and environment together built the brain and then how the brain processes information and uses that to regulate physiology and produce behavior. So... I, I do want to state firmly that evolution doesn't imply genetic determinism, but that certainly doesn't mean that genes are unimportant or can be ignored or neglected or anything like that. It simply means that both genes and environment are relevant in building every aspect of our bodies and minds, including our, our brains. So if we want a comprehensive understanding of whatever psychological or behavioral phenomenon we're talking about, we would need to understand and tackle both genes and environment. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the last misunderstanding I would like to ask you about is uh, that adaptations must be present at birth. That is, if you say that uh, in this case a particular psychological mechanism is an evolved adaptation, a biological adaptation, then uh, it has to be present at birth or uh, in very early stages of development. But, yeah. the, but then, I mean, I guess that we can talk here about uh, things like deferred adaptations and also adaptations that come online in different stages of development or also in different environmental conditions. Sure, yeah. So um, that is another common misconception, the idea that the products of evolution have to be there at birth or they have to emerge very early in development. It's funny, some of these misconceptions, they seem to be more, much more common when they're applied to humans and when they're applied to psychology than when they're applied to anatomy or physiology or morphology and when they're applied to other species. So you'll you'll never really hear anybody saying that, well, because many bird hatchlings can't see and they can't fly when they're first born, that means that vision and flight are not products of evolution in birds. I don't think anybody would say that. But plenty of people will tell you that because babies are not born knowing language or they're not born already with their mate preferences um, already set and they're not born with uh, whatever else, that means that those things are not products of evolution. If they appear later in development, that means that they are a product of learning, which means that they are not a product of evolution. And that kind of ties into another misunderstanding that we can talk about if you like, which is the notion that evolution and learning are opposing explanations. Um, so this misconception and many of the ones that we're talking about, I think, are more common when applied to humans than when applied to other species and more common when applied to psychology than to morphology, for example. Um, yeah, things like breasts, teeth, and facial hair are all examples of things that develop later in life, but they're uncontested products of evolution. And um, 
there simply is no reason to think that the products of evolution must be present at birth. I mean, that's not the way natural selection works. It doesn't produce adaptations that have to be or must be present at birth. It produces adaptations that come online or come to the fore during the ontogenetic phase in, in which they are needed. You mentioned uh, deferred adaptations and um, adaptations that come online in, at different stages. Yeah, and there is this idea that some adaptations may um, come online in order to help children prepare for adulthood. For example, some people think that uh, differences in play between boys and girls may be uh, helping, may, may serve the function of preparing boys and girls for adulthood. So some adaptations may come online as a form of preparation for a later stage, or some adaptations may come online when they are needed, for example, during puberty, a bunch of psychological and physiological adaptations come online. There's also some evidence that, for example, children's fears or babies' fears come online also at the developmental phase in which they are needed. For example, there's some evidence that um, babies don't develop a fear of strangers or strange males until they get to the phase where they begin crawling, which would be the phase that they would potentially start to encounter that danger. So, so yeah, there's plenty of reasons for adaptations to come online at a later point in life and not be present at birth. And I think one of the most common uh, reasons that they come online later is that that is the developmental phase in which they become relevant or needed. Mm -hmm. So now let's move on to another topic. Uh, I mean, I, I would like to ask you about uh, some common, I, I mean, uh, some basic questions about how in evolutionary psychology people generate hypotheses and predictions from those hypotheses. Also to talk, uh, to tackle that first question about the just so stories. So, I mean, in one of your articles, you refer to the fact that at least a good part of uh, the, um, the research in evolutionary psychology stems from middle-level theories derived from the theory of natural selection. And then you move on to talk about how people generate hypotheses and predictions and so on. So could you tell us about that? Sure, yeah. So the idea is that uh, the, there's a hierarchical theoretical structure to evolutionary psychology with at the highest and broadest level you have evolution by natural selection in its modern inclusive fitness formulation at the top, that's the broadest level. And then one step below that are middle level theories that are consistent with evolution by selection but they are applied to a more specific domain like the theory of reciprocal altruism or the theory of parent-offspring conflict, they are still quite broad, but they are more specific than the broad evolutionary theory level. And um, they, of course, are consistent with the, the broader evolutionary theory under which they are nested. And then from these middle-level theories, like parent-offspring conflict or uh, the theory of reciprocal altruism, you can derive more specific hypotheses about a particular species or a particular psychological mechanism and from that more specific hypothesis you can derive a specific concrete testable prediction that you can actually test in studies. Um, is, is that what you're referring to? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I don't know if you want to add something to that. I mean, for example, in terms of the middle level theories, is it the case that all of uh, the research in evolutionary psychology derives from those middle-level theories, or is it sometimes done in a different way? I think um, it's sometimes done in a different way, because sometimes research proceeds using a kind of top-down theory-driven approach, and sometimes it proceeds using a bottom-up observation-driven approach. And so sometimes somebody will start by noticing a phenomenon and then they'll come up with an explanation or a hypothesis that might account for that phenomenon. And um, 
after coming up with an explanation or a hypothesis, derive novel predictions from it and then go ahead and test those novel predictions. And so there is in principle the hierarchical the theoretical structure that we just talked about. In practice, researchers can move from observation to hypothesis that supposedly accounts for the observation and then derive novel predictions from that hypothesis and test them, in which case they're not necessarily going to a middle-level theory, or they're not necessarily deriving their hypotheses from a middle-level theory. And I also think that even if you are working from the theory-driven, top-down approach, particular researchers may come up with an idea, may come up with a hypothesis that was inspired by evolutionary thinking, but wasn't necessarily generated on the basis of a specific middle-level theory. So there's kind of two things going on here. There's the in principle, this is the logical structure that characterizes the theoretical framework uh, that guides evolutionary psychology. But in practice, whether every researcher actually uses that structure to generate their hypotheses is a different question. And there the answer is probably sometimes yes and sometimes no. Mm -hmm. But both the bottom up and the, um, the top-down approach, both of those approaches are valid, right? Yeah, I think so. I think that there's um, a potential danger that exists with the bottom-up approach that doesn't exist with the top-down approach. And that danger is that if you notice a phenomenon, you begin with an observation of a phenomenon, and then you come up with a potential explanation for it, if you just stop there and decide to believe the explanation that you've just concocted without deriving any novel predictions from it and without testing those predictions, then you have engaged in just so storytelling. Um, now, I don't think many researchers actually do that because it's such an elementary error that it's easily avoidable. All you need to do is after noticing a phenomenon and then coming up with an explanation for it, you make sure to derive novel predictions from that new explanation and then you go and test those novel predictions. So as long as you complete the process and you don't simply stop in the middle after concocting uh, an explanation and just decide to believe it without deriving any novel predictions, as long as you complete the process there's, there's no real problem there. Um, and in fact it's an important and valid way of doing science. The other method, the theory-driven or top-down approach, I guess what's interesting about it is that it seems to be essentially immune to the charge of just-so storytelling because it is kind of impossible to make that mistake. You're starting with theory and you are a priori generating a hypothesis on the basis of theory and then generating a prediction on the basis of the hypothesis and then testing the prediction. So it, it doesn't even seem possible to make that uh, just-so mistake. In the case of the observation-driven or bottom-up approach, it is possible to, to lapse into just-so storytelling, but it's also relatively easy to avoid as long as you do what we just said, which is derive novel predictions and test them. And I, maybe I should say this applies to all sciences equally. It's not spe specific to evolutionary psychology or to psychology in general. All sciences have both the theory-driven top-down approach and the observation-driven bottom-up approach. And all sciences have what we just described, which is in the bottom-up approach, if you posit, if you notice an observation or notice a phenomenon, posit an explanation or a hypothesis for it, if you stop there and just decide to believe that without testing any novel predictions from it, you're making the same just-so mistake, even if you're working in cognitive psychology or personality psychology or social psychology, it's, it's not a um, feature that is unique to evolutionary psychology, it's true of all science in general. Mm -hmm. Sure. And another very interesting thing in evolutionary psychology, and perhaps we can also associate a misconception here. So, in evolutionary psychology, uh, researchers are primarily interested in studying species-typical psychological mechanisms and not exactly manifest behavior. And that's also another misconception that people have many times. That is, for example, when they see that in different societies, people in the same domain exhibit uh, 
uh, completely different manifest behaviors then they say, oh, okay, so this has nothing to do with evolution or with biology or with genes. This is completely a socio-cultural construct or something like that. But the, uh, again, you are interested in the psychological mechanisms themselves. So what is the relationship in evolutionary psychological research between these mechanisms? and manifest behavior. I mean, is it that manifest behavior serves as a proxy to these psychological mechanisms or that, for example, if there are different manifest behaviors in different, uh, different uh, ecological conditions, for example, that informs the way the psychological mechanism works? I mean, could you explain that? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think behavior is interesting and important, and most evolutionary psychologists are indeed interested in it. But the problem is that what you said a moment ago, that people will sometimes notice that a behavior varies across cultures and then they'll automatically assume that because the behavior varies across cultures, that means it is not in any way a product of evolution. Evolution is not relevant in explaining or predicting that behavior because look, it varies across cultures. But most evolutionary approaches to psychology suggest that what is going to be universal is not the behavioral output, the manifest behavior, but rather the information processing level of analysis. So if you want to look for universality, if you want to look at the human nature universal level of analysis, what you want to be looking for is the information processing structure of the mechanisms that produce behavior rather than the behaviors themselves. And um, one way of putting it is in the form of like an informal mathematical equation, which is that universal psychological mechanisms plus inputs that differ by culture equals outputs that differ by culture. And what that means is you should not be surprised by, but rather you should actively expect behaviors to vary from culture to culture if the inputs into the mechanisms vary from culture to culture. So for example, um, if you have a universal uh, tendency among humans to avoid disease, and all humans have um, preferences, let's say, for um, mates who are capable of resisting disease, you might find that in some cultures, people place more emphasis on physical attractiveness than other cultures. Does that mean that um, caring about physical attractiveness is not a product of evolution and is simply a purely sociocultural thing. No, what you what you might suggest instead, and this is what researchers have done, is say, well, um, different cultures differ in their parasite load or their pathogen prevalence. And so, what might be going on here is that we all have a universal we have universal mechanisms in terms of mate selection, but in some cultures, because there's a greater parasite load or pathogen prevalence, selecting a mate who is physically attractive, which indicates ability to resist. Um, or might indicate ability to resist parasites and pathogens, that's more important in some parts of the world than in others because it carries more information in some parts of the world than in others. And so you might say, well, these different cultures differ in how much emphasis they place on physical attractiveness, but the reason for that is because the psychological mechanism is universal, but the inputs, in this case, parasite load or pathogen prevalence, differ by culture, and thus they yield outputs that differ by culture, which in this case is how much emphasis is placed on physical attractiveness. And so that is um, exactly what some researchers have done. The only difference is that they did it entirely a priori. They began with theory, generated that hypothesis that different cultures would place different emphases on physical attractiveness as a function of parasite prevalence and pathogen load. And indeed, that's what they found. Um, so yeah, there is this miscon misconception that behaviors must be universal, and if they are not universal, that suggests that evolution is not relevant in producing them. But when you uh, reframe the issue to realize that what most evolutionary, most evolutionary approaches suggest is that the 
information processing level of analysis, that will be universal. Um, and then you acknowledge that different uh, inputs that differ by culture or that differ by ecology into a universal mechanism will still produce outputs that differ by culture, then the problem disappears. And even more importantly, you're able to ma make theoretically grounded a priori predictions about how cultures are expected to vary on the basis of evolutionary reasoning. So another example would be that um, sex ratio differs by culture, such that some cultures have a shortage of men and some cultures have a shortage of women. And because on average men are more oriented towards short-term mating than women, and on average women are more oriented towards long-term mating than men, and because the mating market is a kind of biological market where the rarer sex has greater bargaining power, what you might predict in advance is that those cultures where men are uh, rarer will tilt more toward short-term mating and those cultures where women are rarer will tilt more toward long-term mating. And you can make this theoretically grounded a priori prediction about cross-cultural variation uh, and then you go out and test it, and that is exactly what the studies find. So David Schmidt did a study of something like 48 or 52 cultures where that's what he found. And what I think is important about that is not only the notion that the output of mating strategy or the behavior is uh, can vary across cultures and still be consistent with a universal evolved psychological mechanism, but that those predictions about cross-cultural variation were made in advance a priori on an evolutionary basis. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, in evolutionary psychology, do you also use the term uh, human universals? I'm asking because this is usually associated with anthropology, right? In, uh, human universals. Uh, I, I mean, people look into co uh, cultures and societies across the globe and they try to find, in that case, in the case of anthropology, I guess that many times people are more interested in the manifest behaviors instead of the information processing underlying psychological mechanisms. But uh, when it comes to evolutionary psychology, the most fundamental bit in terms of understanding what our, what is our shared human psychology, let's say, is really the underlying psychological mechanisms, right? I think that's right, yeah. And I think there's a couple of other things going on. One of them is that we tend to be more interested in differences between people and cultures than we are in similarities between people and cultures. We are more captivated by and we pay more attention to differences because if people or other cultures are unlike us, well, that's interesting and novel and um, something to take note of. Whereas if somebody is just like you, you may pay less attention to that or find it less interesting. So we probably have a psychological bias to attend to and be more interested in and remember better differences rather than similarities. And then I think there's that point that you made that sometimes researchers, maybe anthropologists um, or just researchers in general, will be more focused on behavior than on underlying psychology. And, and if you are more focused on behavior, you're going to see more variation from culture to culture than if you're focused on the underlying psychology. Mm -hmm. Right. And when it comes to understanding the psychological mechanisms themselves, I guess that one of the most important theoretical frameworks that people resort to is Steinbergen's four questions, right? The, the, they involve two questions at the proximate level and two others at the ultimate level. The proximate level we have ontogeny, that is understanding the development of the psychological mechanism, for example, uh, at what stage of, of development it comes online and the kinds of inputs from, from the environment that it needs to develop uh, normally, let's say, and also how the mechanism itself works, the kinds of inputs that it processes, the kinds of outputs that it generates, and so on. 
and then at the ultimate level uh, the aspect of phylogeny that is trying to understand its phylogenetic history if it also is present in other species that are phylogenetically rela related to us or not and also the evolutionary function that it serves, right? So, I mean, when it comes to answering all four of these questions, we probably, I guess, we have to gather information from several different sources. So, uh, I mean, uh, how do you go about combining all of those sources of information and see if they really integrate and if they point toward the same underlying psychological mechanism? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think we're far from integrating all four sources in psych all four levels of analysis in psychology and very few researchers work on all four levels of analysis Psychology historically has focused almost exclusively on the proximate level of analysis, so ontogeny and uh, mechanism or immediate causation. And most psychologists focus, I mean, the way that contemporary psychology works is most psychologists focus exclusively on mechanism. Some psychologists, developmental psychologists, focus on ontogeny or ontogeny and mechanism. Evolutionary psychologists typically focus on function and mechanism, and some evolutionary psychologists work in phylogeny, but many don't uh, give it uh, much focus either. And so you have very few people who are focusing on all four levels of analysis, which I think is okay because it's not necessarily the case that an individual researcher or even a team of researchers needs to focus on all four, but the discipline as a whole needs to appreciate the fact that all four levels of analysis are necessary for a comprehensive understanding of whatever phenomenon they're studying. That to me is the most important uh, principle that most psychologists have yet to accept, which is that if you neglect any of these levels of analysis, your understanding of the phenomenon will necessarily be incomplete. And so um, that strikes me as really important. How do you integrate uh, those different levels of analysis? Well, I guess it depends which ones you are working on. For example, uh, for, from an evolutionary perspective, many evolutionary psychologists are interested in function. But the way that you study function involves also studying mechanism. In fact, if your hypotheses are ultimate hypotheses about the function of a particular psychological mechanism, you can't actually study them without studying the proximate details of the working of that mechanism. For example, if I think that disgust has evolved to reduce the likelihood of infection, how, how do I actually study that? Well, I suggest maybe people are more disgusted by more pathogenic items than less pathogenic ones, maybe people's disgust goes up when their immune function goes down, maybe people's disgust is down-regulated when they need to care for kin, like when they need to clean their baby's diapers, um, maybe people are less likely to get sick if they have higher levels of disgust, but all of those, uh, oh, maybe when you prime people with pathogen salient, salience or you disgust them, they are more likely to engage in avoidant motor behaviors or they're more likely to feel less extroverted and less willing to affiliate with other people. But all of those predictions that came from an ultimate hypothesis, they're all proximate predictions. And in fact, it's impossible to study ultimate hypotheses or it's impossible to test ultimate hypotheses uh, without actually cashing them out in terms of the proximate predictions that they yield. So some levels of analysis are relative, have a relatively uh, clear way of integrating them. If you're studying function, you're definitely studying something proximate as well. And um, I think the, the goal is either to get teams of researchers together who have different backgrounds so that those who are better trained in phylogeny and those who are better trained in ontogeny can join with those who are better trained in mechanism and, and, and function and all work together to tackle the question. Or failing that, um, at least a kind of disciplinary awareness that all four are necessary and that if you've put forward an analysis that is just 
functional or just ontogenetic or just mechanistic, that's good, but it's it's incomplete and in that it will never be complete until we tackle all four levels of analysis. Mm -hmm. So another problem when we talk about evolutionary psychology is that some people uh, pit evolutionary hypotheses against socio-cultural ones. And they say that, okay, if you have a mechanism, a psychological mechanism, you can either explain it evolutionarily or socio-culturally, and you can't have both at the same time. But that's another misconception, right? Yeah, I think that's wrong, and I think the easiest way to see why it's wrong has to do with Tinbergen's four questions, because evolutionary analyses or explanations begin at the ultimate level of analysis, and sociocultural hypotheses or explanations are at the proximate level of analysis. So there is no, and there cannot be, an automatic conflict between the two. It is possible for there to be conflict between an evolutionary hypothesis and a sociocultural hypothesis. In order for that conflict to occur, what needs to happen is that the evolutionary explanation or hypothesis must yield approximate prediction that conflicts with approximate predictions yielded by the sociocultural hypothesis. That can and does happen. The mistake, I think, is to think that the two are automatically in conflict just by virtue of being one of them evolutionary and the other one sociocultural. And again, I think the reason, the clearest reason to see why that's wrong is that sociocultural lies at the proximate level of analysis and evolutionary lies at the ultimate level of analysis. And um, there are plenty of evolutionary hypotheses that involve sociocultural inputs and that give a role to sociocultural factors. So, yeah, to, to summarize, I think that the two can conflict in particular instances, but the, the problem is in assuming that they are automatically or necessarily in conflict. Mm -hmm. And we have the exact same kind of problem when we talk about learning, right? That is, people also tend to think that if something is acquired through learning, then it, it can't have an evolutionary basis. It's, again, something sociocultural or something that you get from your parents, for example, or your teachers or something like that, right? But that's another wrong idea. I think so. I think that if you buy, there's these false dichotomies that are really common in psychology, innate versus learned, biological versus culture, evolved versus learned. And if you buy into them, you get this um, neat and simple picture, but incorrect picture, that there are the things that are sociocultural and learned and uh, develop late in life, and there are the things that are evolved and genetically determined and biological and present from birth. And we've already talked about a, a couple of different ways in which that is wrong. Um, one of the ways that this simple false dichotomy manifests itself is evolved versus learned. And again, I think the way to understand why those two should not be pit against each other is using Tinbergen's four questions, because learning is a proximate explanation or approximate answer, and if evolutionary analyses or hypotheses are ultimate level analyses or hypotheses. So an evolved mechanism can evolve a great deal of learning or some learning or no learning. Positing uh, that a mechanism is evolved doesn't commit you to the notion that it, it involves no learning. I mean, we have plenty of, for example, evolved um, fears. And if, if, you know, if I say humans have an evolved fear of snakes and spiders, I'm not claiming that humans are born with a fear of snakes and spiders. I'm claiming that humans learn a fear of snakes and spiders, but that they learn that fear more quickly, more easily, and more readily than other fears. I'm claiming that humans are biologically prepared to learn that fear more easily than they learn other fears. So evolutionary hypotheses are sometimes about learning, and they're certainly compatible with learning. And again, I think the easiest way of seeing why they're not automatically in conflict is Tinbergen's levels. One is ultimate and the other is proximate. Mm -hmm. So I guess this next one is somewhat of a complex question, but let's try to tackle it. Um, do you think that there are instances where learning 
can fundamentally change or create new uh, psychological mechanisms. That is, in terms of uh, the computational aspect of the psychological mechanisms, is it possible for, lear for learning to modify the ones that evolution has created, let's say, or even for it to create completely novel ones? I mean, is that in any way possible? That's an interesting question. Um, I think we should tackle it in two different ways. Mm -hmm. There, There's something known as the Baldwin effect in evolution, and the idea of the Baldwin effect is that you might have an animal learn how to do something, like let's say a, a bird that learns how to crack open a snail's shell so that it can eat it. And um, maybe after this particularly clever or lucky bird learns how to do this, that um, will spread through the population. Perhaps other birds will mimic it or imitate it. And then perhaps in the next generation, their offspring will also learn this behavior, perhaps by mimicking or imitating their parents. And as the generations go by, what's going to happen, according to the Baldwin effect, is that some of these organisms are going to learn this behavior faster than others. And those organisms that are better able to learn this behavior or learn it more quickly are going to probably out-survive and out-reproduce their counterparts. And that's going to result in selection for ability to learn this mechanism more rapidly or, or better. And if you iterate this process over generations, what that's going to do is with each generation, organisms will learn the behavior more quickly, more easily. They'll require less learning to get to the behavior. And if you iterate this process again over more and more generations, organisms will require less and less and less learning to engage in this behavior until the point where they require very little or no learning at all. At that point, this behavior has become encoded into the genome. And that's the idea of the Baldwin effect, is that you start out with um, a behavior that is learned and then it spreads throughout the population, but then as organisms learn it and as we go through multiple generations, some will be better learners or faster learners. They will out-survive and out-reproduce their competitors. Eventually, less and less learning will be required until this uh, behavior is encoded in the genome. And uh, that is a, a way, essentially, for learning to end up creating uh, a, new, a new part of our evolved psychology. Notice, by the way, that it, uh, it sounds Lamarckian, but it's not. I mean, if one bird were to learn how to do something and then it were to be immediately encoded into its genome and it were to have offspring that then know how to do it, that would be a Lamarckian process. But this is, um, this is not that. This is a process whereby there is normal selection in a normal Darwinian fashion for ability to learn or speed of learning. And that just gets better and better and better and better until very little learning is required. So that's the interesting idea of the Baldwin effect. And I, th I think that should maybe count as a way in which learning can alter the psychological makeup of a species over time, though iterated over many generations. The other way to answer the question is within a single organism's life, because it sounded like maybe that was part of what you were asking about, that can learning in a single organism's life alter or create new psychological mechanisms. Yeah, and because that's also some one of the claims that some people make about some psychological mechanisms that they try to tackle them at an ontogenetic level that is trying they, they say that during the lifetime or during the development of a particular individual by being exposed to certain types of information by learning or acquiring certain types of information then the psychological mechanism itself could be altered in some way yeah well you know, I think it's difficult to imagine how a new psychological mechanism or a new information processing circuit could come into being on the basis of learning alone without already having some kind of um, a genetic basis for it existing. Because we know that 
psychological mechanisms are built by genes and environment working together. That means that the environment is relevant and that means that learning is relevant, but it's difficult to see how that side of the equation alone, environment alone or learning alone, could give rise to a new mechanism without also having some genetic basis for that mechanism. So creating a new psychological mechanism on the basis of learning alone seems very difficult. But altering is a, a more modest proposal. And I think that if you, depending on the kinds of environmental inputs you get when you're growing up and depending on the kinds of things you learn, that can modify perhaps the weight that your psychological mechanisms assign to various inputs. It might modify the thresholds at which your psychological mechanisms react to things. For example, the threshold at which you react to a startling stimulus or a disgusting stimulus. And if you consider modifying thresholds and modifying weights as modifying or altering a psychological mechanism, in that case, I would say the answer is yes. And I do think that environmental inputs can do that, modify thresholds and modify weights. But that is um, a different proposal than sort of giving birth to a new psychological mechanism on the basis of environmental input alone. So I would, I would say that that strikes me as implausible, but that altering the way that a psychological mechanism works, especially what, what weights it assigns to various inputs or what thresholds it has for reacting to a particular input on the basis of environmental experience and learning does, uh, does seem plausible. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking a lot about the environment and the effects that the environment might have on human psychology. Uh, I would like to ask you, because I guess it's important to clarify this, in the context of evolutionary psychology, could you tell us what a context or environment means? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I use the terms context and environment roughly interchangeably. Uh, and I, but I have a very broad definition of context and environment that includes the ecological environment, the cultural environment, the social environment, and even the individual's internal physiological environment. I think that defining environment probably requires us to figure out from whose perspective. So if you're talking, for example, from the perspective of a gene, the environment would include the other genes that are present in that body. If you're talking from the perspective of a psychological mechanism, the environment would include not only the culture and the ecology, but the other psychological mechanisms present in, in that mind. Um, so when I think of context or environment, I think of culture, ecology, social environment, and even stuff like an individual's uh, body temperature or immune function, because that serves as uh, a, an input, a potential input into psychological mechanisms, which I guess maybe that's an important point uh, to raise, which is that it's not just wordplay to suggest that um, even the internal physiological functioning of the organism is part of the environment. It, it is actually an important statement because we do think there are psychological mechanisms that take into account stuff like uh, current hormonal state or current immune function or whatever. And so it really is the case uh, in that instance that immune function or hormonal state is serving as an input into a psychological mechanism. And so it makes sense to regard uh, not only culture, ecology, and social um, inputs as environmental, but in a sense, uh, the internal physiological state of the organism is also context or environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, I mean, one of my last questions will be, uh, Evolutionary psychology is primarily interested in understanding or studying uh, un the sort of universal human psychology, right? I mean, what some people would call human nature, but there's also individual variation. And I guess that more recently there have been some evolutionary psychologists, uh, psychologists that have been focusing more and more on that side of the question, on that aspect of human psychology, and also uh, 
how different people might process the same sort of environmental cues in different ways and how that could lead to explain why different people uh, produce, in fact, different uh, behavioral outputs, right? So, uh, I, I mean, evolutionary psychology more and more is also interested in those kinds of questions, right? I think that's true, yeah. I think that there there has been a primary focus on universal species typical mechanisms and probably a secondary focus on sex typical mechanisms but there is this tertiary focus which has been growing like you say on individual differences and individual differences initially seem a little bit more difficult to understand from an evolutionary perspective but um, progress has been made in, in explaining and predicting individual differences and there are several theoretical frameworks for understanding how and why individuals might differ. Um, so for example, and sometimes you, you have individual differences that seem like they might be chaotic or arbitrary or difficult to explain, but then when you look underneath the hood it turns out that there is an underlying systematism that can explain or predict these individual differences um, in a systematic fashion. So for example, you might notice that different individuals are more or less demanding in their mating standards. Some are choosier and some are less choosy. And of course, as most people know, on average females are choosier than males, but there's also the issue that within males some are choosier than others and within females some are choosier than others. And initially you might not know how to explain that, you might not know how to understand that, but when you look underneath the hood it turns out that there is something that can predict this in a systematic fashion which is an individual's own mate value, that individuals who are higher in mate value or more desirable on the mating market tend to demand more in their mating standards and those who are less desirable tend to demand less. And so that's an, an instance in which an initially perhaps difficult to understand individual difference does yield to systematic explanation or systematic prediction once you have uh, figured out what the relevant predictor is. Another example might be um, anger, individual differences in who angers uh, easily or not so easily. So Aaron Sell and colleagues have worked on this and have found that it is possible to generate a priori theoretically grounded predictions about individual differences in anger. And um, in this case, uh, it would take a while to explain the, the background for why this is the case, but the prediction is that more attractive men and women and more physically formidable men will anger more uh, quickly than their less attractive and less formidable counterparts. That's what the theory uh, predicts, and then when you go out and test it, that's exactly what you find. And so there's an example where what might have first seemed inexplicable or unpredictable, individual differences in who angers easily and who doesn't, turns out to be not only explicable, but predictable in advance a priori on the basis of evolutionary reasoning. And so, yeah, I think that um, as evolutionary psychology has advanced, it has moved from an initial focus on species-typical and sex-typical mechanisms to a growing awareness and interest in individual differences, in explaining them and predicting them a priori. Mm -hmm. There are some examples there that are very interesting and th that made me think that Okay, so uh, let's say that some people vary in terms of their mate preferences because they have different physical attributes, let's say. So, I mean, um, uh, the, the way to explain that, could it be on the one hand that uh, their physical attributes are accompanied by uh, differences at the level of their brains in terms of how they are organized and I mean there is a correlation between their physical attributes and the way their brain uh, develops in some way or that they have the physical attributes and then uh, their psychological mechanisms include that fact, that piece of information in uh, in, their, in the way they process uh, 
their mate preferences in this case and so uh, I, I mean uh, would it be sort of facult uh, a facultative mechanism there I mean uh, would it attend to the fact that someone is more or less physically formidable and then uh, lead him to a particular kind of mate preference? I mean, the, the, I guess that this is a complicated question, but do, do you understand what I'm trying to ask? I, I think so, yeah. I think you're asking if there could be, let's say, a facultative mechanism for mate preferences that takes into account one's own physical attributes when uh, yielding one's preferences. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, okay, if that could be an explanation, or on the other hand, that was my first hypothesis. If it could simply be the case that it happens for some reason that an individual that has a particular kind of physical attribute also happens to be accompanied with a brain that is organized in a way that. Uh, pr uh, predisposes him to a particular kind of mate preference. I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know how, how this would occur. Possibly uh, through some sort of hormonal mechanism or something like that. But I mean, do you understand the question? I do. Yeah, and I think both of those are possible. The second thing that you posit would be a kind of accidental correlation, I guess, between the physical features of the person and the preferences that they have. Um, the first thing, the other thing that you posited would be a more systematic relationship between a person's physical attributes and the preferences that they have, whereby a person's psychological mechanisms for mate preferences actually take into account one's own physical attributes as an input and then um, yield a process and yield one's preferences as an output. I think either of those could be true. It's also possible that somebody's physical features are relevant but they are not a direct input into one's mate preference mechanisms. For example, um, instead of my mate preference mechanisms taking my own physical features as an input, what, what might happen is my own physical features might lead me to be rejected by mates or perhaps accepted by mates over my uh, years uh, growing up or over my years dating or whatever. And um, as I get rejected or accepted, that may influence my self-perceived mate value. And then my self-perceived mate value might be an input into my um, mate preference mechanisms. And so which of these things is actually going on is, is an open empirical question. But I do think that one way of understanding individual differences in something like mate preferences or anger is to think about inputs in the body or in the mind uh, that feed into our mate preferences mechanisms, mate preference mechanisms, and then um, affect our, our output. So that, you know, those who are more attractive or those who have met with more success in the past end up computing a higher self-perceived mate value, and then that leads them to have higher standards in mating. So yeah, that's one, I think, of many different ways that we can try to explain and predict individual differences in, um, in behavior or psychology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me just ask you one last question. So sure. evolutionary psychology is focused on uh, understanding human psychology as it is now, or as it has evolved over time until the present moment. But, of course, we are still evolving. So it is probably the case that in the future, in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or, or even millions of years, if we are still around, then we will probably have a different psychology by being exposed to different selective pressures. So is it the case that evolutionary psychology also has a sufficiently good theoretical framework for people to make testable predictions about uh, how our human psychology will evolve in the future? Uh, I think the responsible scientific answer is probably not. Uh, the reason being that 
how we evolve in the future depends on what selection pressures are set up by the environment. And there's so much we don't know about what the environment looks like. And if we don't know what the environment looks like, then we don't know what the selection pressures are. So we don't know what kind of direction our species will take. Like we don't know, for example, uh, whether we'll kill each other in a nuclear winter, whether whether we'll make contact with extraterrestrials, terrestrials, whether, um, you know, what will happen in terms of uh, global warming and climate change. As long as it's difficult to, or, you know, even things like what will become of uh, nations and markets and other environmental factors like that. And as long as it's difficult or impossible to figure out what those environmental conditions will be, then it becomes difficult or impossible to figure out what the selection pressures will be and therefore the trajectory of evolution of our species. But um, I think it is possible to put on, let's say, put on a speculation hat and, and speculate a little bit. And um, for example, cigarettes kill people, but cigarettes have not been around long enough for us to evolve uh, to f a fear of them or a disgust of them. And so we might be able to say something like, imagine a future in which cigarettes are still present, they are still killing people, and other environmental factors are not, let's say, interfering and, and uh, disrupting this process. Uh, well then, after uh, a few hundred thousand years from now, perhaps humans will have evolved a fear or a disgust of cigarettes. So I think that we can try to make some statements like that, um, but we do need to say, you know, imagine condition X obtains and Y obtains and Z obtains, then if those are all the case, then uh, perhaps the following will happen. What makes it really difficult is the fact that it's difficult or impossible to predict what the environment will, will look like. Um, and I guess the other thing I would add with my speculation hat on is that the more you get an interdisciplinary group together so that maybe we have climate scientists telling us what the climate will look like and we have people um, from different fields working together, perhaps we would be able to do a little bit better in terms of predicting the future uh, evolution of our species because we would be able to hear from, let's say, the geologists or the meteorologists or the climate scientists, we'd be able to hear what the environment might look like. Um, but my my primary answer is that there's a, there's a huge difference between explaining uh, human psychology as it is now and predicting unknown features of human psychology as they are now those are both doable and uh, are part of evolutionary psychology. And then predicting the future course of the evolution of our species is a much riskier and uh, much more difficult endeavor. And so I think we would have much less confidence and certainty in that. So yeah, I do think that in some cases we can make predictions like perhaps the cigarette one that I mentioned, but in principle, much more difficult and lower confidence and lower certainty than... Uh, making predictions about current humans, but un currently unknown features of, of the human mind. Mm -hmm. But then it is not a problem with the evolutionary psychology theoretical framework. It's really a broader scientific limitation in terms of us not knowing or, being, or it being very uncertain for us to know the kinds of environments and selective pressures we will be exposed to. Right. I think I think that's right, yeah. I think that um, it also highlights what we talked about before, the fact that the environment is crucial because it sets up the relevant selection pressures that drive the evolution of the species. So if you, if you don't have knowledge of what the environment and what the selection pressures will look like, then it becomes very difficult to make those predictions. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So Leif, let's end the interview here. Before we go, would you like to tell people what, uh, where, where they can find you on the internet? You, your work? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, you can find uh, me on Twitter, where I've got uh, my real name, Leif al Shawaf. And you can find uh, a lot of my research along with colleagues on ResearchGate. Again, Laith Al Shawaf, which I'm guessing it'll be spelled somewhere in this interview when it comes out. And um, 
Other than that, in, uh, you can also find me on my university webpage, uh, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. You can always find me there. And I always welcome uh, suggestions, criticisms, collaborations, whatever, from anybody who, who would like to chat. So I'd be very open to that. Okay, great. So it was a real pleasure to have you on the show and thank you for taking the time. Same. Thank you, Ricardo. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my Patreons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Greg Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jack, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Wittingberg, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, and Bo Weingart, my four producers, Isar Weber, Rosie, Jim Frank, and Lucas Stafiniak, and my executive producer, Michelle Ruzieski. Thank you for all.